Today I'm out in Washington with the most insane Kia ever conceived and one of the most bonkers EVs available in North America, period. This is the Kia EV6 GT, and it can go 0 to 60 in 3.2 seconds. Style-wise, the EV6 looks every bit a performance car. It has a low-slung hood and very short hood profile that you might expect in an exotic rear-engined vehicle. That's, of course, because this is a dedicated platform EV. Now, some shoppers are not going to like the fact that the GT, which is the most expensive version of the EV6, looks very much like the rest of the EV6 lineup, actually. We have the same angry headlights, we have a slight change to the lower bumper and the grill section right there, but every EV6 has this really low-slung hood, and it is definitely very, very low. Moving around to the side, again, that low-slung short hood profile is very, very obvious, as is the fact that this is not as boxy and as practical as the upcoming Ionic 5. And that would be the Ionic 5N, I should say, because that is going to be the Hyundai performance variant built on this same platform. I recently had the opportunity to see that in person at the Goodwood uh, Festival in the UK, and it does share an awful lot with the EV6 GT, so we'll certainly be talking about that in this video. Moving around the side, you'll notice we have wide tires, sticky summer tires, 255 width, with of course these sort of uh, lime green brake calipers, front and rear unique wheels, and a rear end design that is less practical, a little bit more sport back, maybe hatchback than exactly SUV shaped. When it comes to cargo practicality, the boxy shape of the Ionic 5N is going to have a significant advantage over the EV6, but this style is definitely my preference when it comes to sporty look. We have this spoiler on top, a little bit of a ducktail spoiler there, this very distinctive light strip that runs one side to the other, but again, a lot of this is very much the same as the regular EV6, so there's some pros and cons to that. You can get this same dynamic look in the regular model, but if you spend the extra for the GT, maybe it's not going to feel quite as special as maybe a BMW M3 versus the regular 3 Series. The charge door is located back here next to the rear taillight module, very similar to what we find in some modern Teslas, but of course it still uses the CCS charge connector, not the NACS connector. Now, recent news since the last time I drove one of these is that Kia has committed to the NACS connector format. So over the next about 18 to 24 months, we will finally see that connector on the EV6. We just don't know too many details about when that will be and whether or not those superchargers will actually support the fast DC fast charge times of the EV6. Now let's get to the nuts and bolts. What makes the EV6 GT interesting? What Kia did was they kept the same 77.4 kilowatt hour battery pack from the rest of the lineup. Apparently this battery pack is capable of dissipating a lot of power very, very quickly, in addition to charging very rapidly, but we'll get to that in a moment. The next thing they did was dial the power from 320 horsepower all the way up to 576, which is quite a lot for a Kia. How they did that is interesting. They took the rear electric motor from the regular dual motor Kia EV6 and they jammed it up front, which means it loses the mechanical front axle disconnect. One reason that efficiency is a little lower in this model than in the regular all-wheel drive version. Then they cooked up a new, much more powerful rear electric motor and gave that one a limited slip differential in the rear. That brings everything up to 576 horsepower, but rather unfortunately drops your range to just over 200 miles. That's a pretty big drop versus the rest of the EV6 lineup. Although in our driving, this was a little bit more efficient than we had expected. The combination is good enough to get you from 0 to 60 in 3.2 seconds. And as we're going to talk about in the drive section, the most intriguing thing about the EV6 was Kia's dedication to cooling the inverters and the battery unit itself. Because this will not only do 0 to 60 in 3.2 seconds when the battery is full, it will also do that when the battery is relatively empty. And that is rather unusual for an electric car. From a Rivian R1T and R1S, which have absolutely bonkers 0 to 60 times, to a Model 3 or Model Y performance, most EVs actually start derating performance below 80%. And if you have a Mustang Mach-E GT, I hate to tell you, this is going to be quicker all the time. Because the Mach-E GT hasn't really been performing as a lot of folks had expected, and we certainly never received the claimed 0 to 60 times. This actually ended up being a little bit quicker. Now, if you're wondering about the Ionic 5N and how it's different, 
essentially it's going to use the same electric motors. But what Hyundai did for that model is they dialed the cooling dial from 11 all the way up to 15. They added another air conditioning unit under the hood whose only purpose is to cool the motors and the inverters and the battery. Then they changed the battery so it can dissipate even more power and have even better cooling. And for Hyundai, they say that the difference is going to be that the EV6 GT is fast in a straight line, fast at maybe a big track for a while, but it's not designed to do 10 minutes of track duty, 10 minutes of DC fast charging, and then 10 minutes of track duty again. And that's a pretty big, bold claim for the Ionic 5N. We have yet to see whether it is real world capable, but that's really a big change versus this. Charging that 77.4 kilowatt hour battery pack happens back here in the rear. The onboard AC charger is rated for approximately 11 kilowatts, which is pretty speedy for a mainline EV with a battery in this size range. What's always been interesting about eGMP platform vehicles from Hyundai, Kia, and Genesis, though, is the 800 volt DC fast charging. Admittedly, you can't charge this fast everywhere. That's another key thing we'll talk about later. But if you find the right DC fast charge station, this can go 10% to 80% in just 18 minutes. And it most certainly can. In fact, earlier this week, we were caravanning in a Model Y and this vehicle. The Model Y was actually a little bit more full than this. This charged to 90% faster than that Model Y, even though it took a little bit longer to authorize because this battery charges fast. And if you want to go zero to 100%, it only takes 43 minutes. In that time frame, a Mach E GT would only go 10% to 80%. So even though the electric driving range of this model is going to be just over 200 miles, if you were to road trip this against a Mach E GT, this is going to take less time to get to your destination because you're going to spend an awful lot less time DC fast charging. And the DC fast charging experience between those two vehicles is going to be pretty similar. Versus a Model 3 or Model Y, that does get a little bit trickier. Another consideration for folks shopping EV6 GT line versus EV6 GT is going to be the front seats. We lose the power functionality, and that's because these seats have been borrowed out of other Hyundai and Kia models. They are a very aggressive sport seat design that I find pretty comfortable, except that lack of adjustable lumbar support and lack of electric adjustability. You are also going to lose the ventilated seat functionality, which is something that I really loved in our long-term EV6. But if you're comparing this to the Ionic 5N, it's going to be basically the same seat situation up front. Legroom is excellent in the EV6. With this front seat adjusted for me, you can see I have gobs of legroom left. You could very easily put rear-facing child seats back here or people with longer legs. We also have a completely flat floor, as you'd expect in a modern EV. Lots of headroom here in the middle. If I scoot over to the right side of the vehicle, again, lots of legroom going on there, but you might notice that my head is a little bit closer to the side of the vehicle, and that's due to the very aggressive bell shape to the body. On the other hand, headroom is pretty reasonable. If I put my head back here to the headrest, my head is just touching the ceiling, but it is pretty comfortable in a more natural seating position like this. As far as the general dimensions go, on the inside, this sort of splits the difference between a Model 3 and a Model Y. The seat bottom cushion is a little closer to the ground than the Model Y, and we get a little bit less headroom in here, but we have a little bit more room than we would get in the Model 3, and my legs are not quite as in my chest as they would be in a Model 3 performance. Behind the rear hatch, cargo capacity is solid. It's not quite as roomy as the Ionic 5N because of its boxier rear end, or maybe I should say quite as practical, because this cargo area is actually a little bit longer, but it's not quite as tall and it's certainly not quite as square. In the end, depending on your luggage or what you're putting in the trunk, one might be a little bit more practical over the other, but I would say in general terms, my win would be given to the Ionic 5N. There is a little bit of additional storage space under the floor, and under the hood, we have a teeny tiny little storage area, just about enough room to store your EVSE. That's why we have that really low slung hood and very short hood. There is enough room in here, of course, to also put the vehicle to load connector, which is kind of a unique feature in the Kia, Hyundai, and Genesis EV platforms. You plug this into the charge port in the back, and then you can pull enough power to run a number of lights, maybe small power tools. It's going to give you just over a thousand watts of power output ability, which is certainly enough to camp on, run your house for a short time, etc. I do think that's a really practical touch, and there are also some electrical outlets in the vehicle that you can use as well. But if you're looking for a big suitcase swallowing front trunk, you're not going to find one in this EV.
On the inside, one reason that you might want to get this over a Mach-E or a Tesla is that we have a pretty typical moonroof here. If you want a moonroof that closes with a shade or opens so that we can get more air in the vehicle, you want this. If you want something that's going to give you a lighter and airier feel in the back rather than that definitely black hole kind of vibe we find back there, then you're going to want the Mach-E or the Tesla. The driver and front passenger have height adjustable shoulder belts, but you can see that in this model, we have fixed in place headrests and seats that definitely look very much like a five point harness seat. Although these were not designed for five point harness capability from the factory. You'd actually have to swap these out if you wanted to do that. Since this is the GT, we have those same sort of lime green touches that we found on the outside on the inside, including that piping, some stitching there in the center of the seat. And you can really see how aggressive the bolstering is on the seat back and on the seat bottom cushion as well. On the front doors, we have a lot of soft touch materials, including this imitation suede insert right here in the middle of the door panel. Now, one thing to keep in mind about imitation suede is that long term, this kind of material can start to pill. So you really want to be careful about that as far as sliding around on those imitation suede surfaces. They also are going to be a little bit tougher to clean than the upper section of the door or the upper section of the dashboard. Speaking of the dashboard, it has a very similar style to the GT line with this very linear format of soft touch material on the dash. I think this is really an interesting look. We have the GT badging over there and configurable ambient lighting below. That strip runs across the doors and then across the dashboard. You can change its color. It would be kind of cool if that had more of a texture to it. It is very flat, very linear right there as far as that goes. We have a very large glove box inside. It's actually really deep. You can fit a large laptop computer or some of those larger tablet computers in there pretty easily. And then in the center of everything, we have the big twin screen dashboard setup that we find in a lot of modern Kias. The LCD here, of course, supports CarPlay and Android Auto, but not wireless CarPlay or wireless Android Auto. We have the home screen there. We have some dedicated EV screens over here. Some cool touches here that are probably worth noting are the EV charge transfer settings that allows you to tell the vehicle when to turn off the vehicle to load functionality. And then over here, you can say how much you want the DC or AC chargers to charge your battery. Pretty typical there. You can adjust the charging current and we have the battery conditioning mode. They've renamed that from winter mode, which was a little bit confusing to actually tell us what that mode is actually doing. If you want to know more about that software, you can check out other Kia videos. It's basically the same software we find in a large number of models. Also similar to what we find in those other models are these dual function controls. This is not my favorite touch since this knob is both the uh, temperature for the vehicle, as well as the power and volume knob for the infotainment system. I do think that's a little bit quirky. This is where we find a USB charge only port, USB input for the system. That's what interfaces with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto there. Sorry for the dirt on the floor mats. It's really wet and uh, very grassy out there. We have USB charge and 12 volt power charge ports there. And then a pretty large storage bin just under this sort of a uh, floating center console motif that we find above that. This is where we find the rotary shifter. You can see the controls right there and that rotary knob. We find the power button for the vehicle, uh, heated seat controls up there and heated steering wheel controls. Behind that, we find a Qi wireless charger mat, a button for the 360 degree camera system, auto brake hold, parking sensors, two cup holders right there, and a pretty big center console storage area. This has the same sort of texture that we found on the dashboard. The LCD instrument cluster is pretty configurable and we have a full color augmented reality heads up display just above that. Those are definitely touches you won't find in a modern Tesla. Moving out from there, we find a pretty traditional sports steering wheel with a flat bottom and paddles on the back of the steering wheel. These paddles control the regeneration mode of the EV system. So you can adjust the pedal from basically one pedal drive to coasting. It's your choice. You can also have an automated mode. It's indicated by the uh, indications there on the instrument cluster where the vehicle is going to use the radar sensor to automatically adjust the regen braking based on traffic around you. Over here, we have the controls for the adaptive cruise control system, buttons to control that multifunction LCD cluster up there, a drive mode selector. This cycles between the three main drive modes, eco, normal, and sport. This GT button takes things to the next level, cycling from the GT mode to the My Drive mode. And then over here, we have controls for the infotainment system. 
The My Drive Mode settings are adjusted via this infotainment system. You can adjust the motor output, the steering, the suspension. This does have an adaptive suspension, something that we don't find in the current Model 3 or Model Y. You can adjust the ELSD in the back and stability control. And this is kind of interesting twist because you could have Sport Plus there with normal steering. You could have the comfy suspension if you wanted to and you can have the ELSD in Sport Plus and you can have it automatically turn off stability control if you just really wanted to go crazy. Now it's time to get the EV6 GT out on the road. So we have our resident Tesla expert, Travis, in the car driving. Uh, and we're gonna talk about performance numbers first uh, because those are truly impressive with the EV6 GT. Zero to 60, 3.2 seconds, which is faster than the Model Y performance. Yep. A little bit slower than the Model 3 performance but the quarter mile times, absolutely fantastic in comparison with the Teslas. And the repeatability of those zero to 60s also particularly impressive, especially when we're talking about performance at, I would say, average states of charge. Yeah, I think that's what you're gonna get most out of this from an everyday standpoint is the repeatability of that mm -hmm. zero to 60 time. I mean, that's one of the electric vehicle party tricks is, yeah. is the punch, it's the off the line, it's the how could we get going as fast as possible. And, and in the Tesla, as long as you're charged up, you'll get a significant one. And as it comes down, you'll slowly see that come down. In this, it's just over and over and over again. And that's really one of the big reasons to get this over the competition. Yeah. Uh, very similar, I would say, actually, performance metrics to something like a Porsche Taycan, in mm -hmm. a way, is that you charge your Tesla to 80 or 90% because you want to keep your battery nice and healthy, right? Yep. Um, but then you drive it out for, I don't know, 50 miles yep. and all of a sudden you can't actually win that stoplight race. Well, right. not that we're condoning stoplight racing, mind you, but you can't actually win that stoplight race anymore against this, even if this is only 40% state of charge. Very really interesting twist. And I think it's, you know, it's a brief aside, but you mentioned the Porsche Taycan and that's what they've done over the Tesla Plaid as well. The mm -hmm. Model S and the Model X Plaid is that it's the repeatability. And it yeah. depends on what you want for performance, but I think by all metrics, this is a better performance vehicle, not just from the zero to 60 and the repeatability of it, but also the uh, the focus on suspension. And I mean, small things, but like these seats are way preferred mm -hmm. or preferable to what you're gonna find in the Model 3 performance yeah. because they're actually gonna hold you into those corners if you do wanna take it for an That's autocross true. event yeah. or a track day. And like we were talking about earlier, part of me is actually surprised that we haven't seen a performance package from Tesla that doesn't necessarily focus on zero to 60, but gives you ceramic brakes and mm -hmm. wheel flares and sticky grippy tires and that kind of next level of, of tweak, which oddly enough, we do find in here. So if you are that person that wants the sportier feel of the interior and differentiation of that interior component, uh, we definitely have that in here. You know, we also find a suspension tune. Right now we're in the normal mode. Uh, let's move it over to Sport Plus. We have an adaptive suspension system, which you don't find in the Model 3 or Model Y at any price. Um, it's not the most variable, I would say, as far as its character. Yeah. But this never has that bouncy kind of feel that we find in a Mach-E GT or a Model 3 Model Y. Yeah, I mean, even in the, in the Sport Plus, I would say this is stiff, but the bouncy is not something you get from it. Mm -hmm. You can feel it absorbing the impacts, but it never feels like it's rocking you around while it does so. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you look at something like the Polestar Performance uh, models and you get the, uh, the, the different damper settings yeah. on those. But you have to get out. But you have to get out. <laughs> And um, I don't know about you, but I don't want to get out of my car and then tweak something under there and then get back in my car only to then want to change it later. I mean, I think that's really focused on like your autocross event. And, mm -hmm. and at that point, it's nice to have. But I think when you look at like this, at those higher performance models, um, like the Taycan or an e-tron GT or, you know, some of those, mm -hmm. those similar, um, we get a lot of that function in here. And I can't tell you why Tesla doesn't have it as an option because if you threw sport seats and stickier tires from a factory package and maybe it is an adjustable damper or yeah. even just an adjustable spring setting, um, I think I think there's an audience for it. But in yeah. the meantime, this is the market. Yep, it is. And that really does affect not just the handling uh, feel of the vehicle, mm -hmm. but you know, perhaps in, in a way your performance out on an autocross course, if you wanted to do that in your EV6 GT, which you could, yeah. um, you know, being able to stay in the seat is gonna help you be faster, even if the grip levels are similar. Because the grip levels on a Model 3 performance are pretty decent. And yeah. you could put 
Sticky summer tires on it if you want aftermarket. Yep. Tire size is actually pretty similar. 255s in this one. You can get some pretty wide tires uh, on the Tesla lineup. So, you know, not too far apart there. In our stock 60 to 0 testing in an ED6 uh, that we had for only 24 hours, we couldn't do any filming there. Mind you guys, sorry about that. But we did have the ability to 0 to 60, 60 to 0 tested, et cetera, over a day in Los Angeles. We repeatedly got a stopping distance of just 104 feet, which is pretty damn good, I have to say, for a heavy EV. This is 700 pounds heavier than a Model 3 performance. Yeah, and those Model 3s tend to be on the lighter side of, of most electric vehicles on the market, mm -hmm. but when you want stopping power, you have those bigger brakes. And again, mm -hmm. that's what you find here on the GT, which is different than the other models, but you're you're not gonna find it in, as an option in a Tesla Model 3 or a Model Y. and and. So in the meantime, it's this yeah. or the upcoming Ionic 5N. And we should talk about efficiency. On the way down here, we averaged about 3.3 miles per kilowatt hour in this exact EV6 GT from Seattle. And in the Model Y, it averaged about 3.8. So I was surprised by that. I'm not sure if you were, but this is EPA rated for considerably fewer miles than yeah. the Model Y. In the real world, it seems like the Model Y, at least on that route, same conditions, using the heater, it was raining. Uh, obviously, that's going to affect the amount of resistance on the tires, etc. Yeah. But in the real world, the range act scores of the vehicles actually kind of narrowed. The Model Y will still get you further, but this was looking maybe about 250 miles instead of 206, 208, whatever it's rated for. Um, and that Model Y long range back there, it's not the newest of the long ranges, right. but it's still rated for about 300 miles. So I was kind of surprised by that difference. Yeah, like I said, when you start to make those compromises, you expect to see some drop-offs. And if they're running pretty close, then you're not making such a compromise. I do think um, that speaks to a continuing issue with the EPA rating for electric vehicles, mm -hmm. which is to say they are not very helpful. Yeah, and uh, they are inconsistent, we should say, because this effectively... The Model Y and this were rated on two different EPA cycles that are both allowed, essentially. If you want to know more about that, we have other videos on it. Yep. Um, but that's part of what's going on. I still didn't kind of expect the difference to be that close in a way. Kia, of course, does have battery conditioning. We have the heat pump in both vehicles. Both vehicles have heated seats. Neither one has ventilated seats because right. this model deletes them for the GT. Um, so both have that same level of ability to improve efficiency in colder weather, et cetera. Um, you know, charge speeds, again, we talked about that a little earlier in the video. They're going to be relatively similar depending on what you have access to. This is going to charge faster as far as the minutes, mm -hmm. but your entire charge experience could take extra time. Yeah, and when you're looking at planning a trip, you know, the charge time is not just how much energy goes in, mm -hmm. it's how often you need to charge. Some of that has to do with efficiency. Um, this has a fairly large battery, so you, there's, there's going to be a trade off, but if you're doing 500 miles, it'd be pretty similar. If you're doing mm -hmm. 1,000 miles, you would really start to notice the difference. Yeah, especially in this specific model with these tires, again. Um, now, it's kind of tricky, again, because, you know, this takes only 18 minutes to do 10% to 80%, and that Model Y is going to be over 30 minutes, yeah. it, realistically, in most situations. Um, it's going to depend on the supercharger you stop at, the condition of the battery, etc. All that's going to factor in. But generally speaking, it's going to take longer to go 10% to 80%. But it's not going to take as long for the station to authorize. There are going to be more stations in more de uh, more uh, corridor kind of areas on interstate highways. Yep. And the likelihood of you finding a plug that doesn't work does seem to be higher on the various networks that are available for this vehicle. Because it's not just one, it's not just EA, there's also EVgo, there's ChargePoint, there's all those various networks out there. And among them all, none of them really seems to have quite as much maintenance going on as Tesla. Right, right. And if you're pulling up to us, a supercharger station you're looking at normally at least six charging stop mm -hmm. or stalls but if you're pulling up to an electrify america there might be four and if one right. of those isn't working that's 25 percent of yeah. those chargers that are not working and if as ev ownership continues to increase or if you're in an area where people often utilize those uh, level three right. chargers that's 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 going to back up pretty quickly yeah it is kind of a tricky construct because it's going to depend on where you live but far over 90% of all the EVs on the road that charge over 150 kilowatts are Teslas, like yeah. almost 98%. So the weird trick with that does seem to be when we were, for instance, charging this and our other EV charging experiences around, 
generally speaking, if you go to a place where there's a supercharger and an EA station back to back, mm -hmm. yeah, the EA station has maybe a fourth the number of, of stalls. But when we were there, we were there with a Mach E, and we were the only ones at the EVgo. Yeah. And across at the Tesla station, it was completely full. So yeah. you know, there there is this this debate. Like you know, yes, the stations are smaller and they have fewer plugs, but there just aren't as many things that actually charge this fast. Right. I think the on-road bottom line with the EV6 is that this is some really impressive EV engineering from a company that that really just burst out of almost nowhere for EVs. I mean, they had a Soul EV, they had a Nero EV, neither one would set your hair on fire. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we have a nearly 600 horsepower Kia. It's it's an impressive range because those two models you just mentioned were on the efficiency end yeah. of things. They were the frugal option. And mm -hmm. then uh, here comes an EV6 out of, you know, not nowhere, but uh, it, it kind of lit the world on fire. It was, what is this machine? And now yeah. we have an EV6 GT that is, again, setting a new benchmark. And um, mm -hmm. they, they just announced a few days ago the next models in the lineup. We don't seem to get all of those here in the U.S., but yeah. Kia just continues to expand on the EV they're uh, on a big, program. huge roll. Yeah. And, and what I find intriguing is that we are not getting a 576 horsepower EV from, you know, performance-oriented brands like Dodge or mm -hmm. necessarily even Ford. I mean, the Mustang GT has good numbers but mm -hmm. doesn't have good performance numbers in a way. Yeah. And the Germans, very expensive for their performance EV options, which are fantastic. Yeah. And this is by no means, uh, you know, an i4M competitor or anything along those lines. The interior is not as nice as an AMG not saying that but what I am saying is I'm I'm intrigued by the fact that we get such a dedication to performance here yeah fast charging faster charging than we find in those German options but it's in a Kia and when you really think of some of the things that this vehicle can do as far as the drivetrain engineering the next thing that comes to mind is a Porsche which is right. bonkers so how much will the EV6 set you back? Well, this is essentially $63,000 as equipped. And the EV6 GT comes essentially one way. You pick your color, you pick whether you want floor mats or not, and that's about it. Depending on how you want to configure it, this could be significantly more or a little bit less expensive than a Model Y. The Model Y starts out about $10,000 less than this for the Model Y Performance. The Model 3 Performance is a little bit less expensive than that. But remember, the Model 3 and Model Y, you have to pay quite a bit extra if you want a red paint job like you find on this model. It's about a two grand option. You also will pay extra for the different interior colors, whether you want autopilot, enhanced autopilot, I should say, full self-driving, etc. Now, there is no corollary to full self-driving on this vehicle, but I would say that the Highway Drive Assistant is approximately the corollary of uh, the autopilot system. It has aggressive lane centering. Remember, autopilot is a hands-on-the-wheel steering assistant system. But you will find features in here you don't find in the Tesla lineup, like the heads-up display, the larger LCD infotainment system, etc., sportier seats, better braking, and better long-term performance. So, if you are wanting to go 0 to 60 in 3.2 seconds below 80% state of charge, this is going to be significantly faster. In our testing with an EV6 GT in our own hot little pause, we ran 0 to 60 in 3.2 seconds when the battery was at 25% state of charge. It didn't start derating that down until the battery was practically dead or practically emptier than most people would ever want to take it. At 10% state of charge, it was still going really swiftly, still about four and a half seconds, zero to 60 or so, and it was really down there towards the bottom that performance really dropped off dramatically. That is very, very impressive, and it's kind of a harbinger of what we should see in the Ionic 5N, because that's gonna take this to the next bonkers level with even more improvements to the handling ability braking ability, performance ability as far as track ability performance than we find in this model. That's what I find so intriguing about the EV6 GT and perhaps unexpected for a company like Kia to cook up a very performance focused vehicle was surprising to say the least. Now EV6 is not Taycan-like levels of performance, definitely not. That is theoretically and interestingly where the Ionic 5N is going to come into the equation. But you could certainly take a look at the braking and handling ability and the level of change that we find on the EV6 GT 
and you will see a very similar level of change in some of the BMW and Mercedes performance models. Very interesting twist there. With the Model 3 and Model Y performance, they are wicked fast, but again, the performance level drops off a little bit, and there isn't as much of a change as far as the interior, the exterior, and the handling ability versus the regular dual motor models of those same Tesla options. Bottom line with the EV6 GT, it is fantastic fun. I think for a lot of folks, charging is really going to be a bigger concern. If you are doing a lot of road trips and you live in an area where the supercharger network is the king, then that's gonna be the king. And this, even with a magic dock availability, upcoming NACS connector availability, it may not necessarily improve that situation. We really don't know how Kia's DC fast charging experience will be on the supercharger network. At the moment, it's pretty limited. With a Magic Dock, this vehicle is going to charge only at 60 kilowatts, and that is really, really slow for a modern EV. That has to do with the incompatibility of this 800 volt architecture with the current V3 supercharger network. V4 most likely will support 800 volt charging, but some of those details are a little bit uncertain at the moment as far as how they're going to interact with the EV6 GT specifically. The other factor for some shoppers is gonna be the lack of availability of the $7,500 tax credit. And that could make a significant difference in affordability for this versus the Model 3 performance or Model Y performance. This is built in South Korea. It's not built in the United States. And as a result, it does not qualify for that tax credit on purchases. If you lease an EV6, then it will get the tax credit treatment in the lease program but if you really wanna buy one, you'd have to buy out your lease, and that's an extra layer of complication not everybody is interested in. On the other hand, if you do plan on leasing, it's not gonna make a difference. Or if you don't qualify for any portion of the tax credit, it's not gonna make a difference either. Remember that there is income testing that will apply to that, so if you're making enough money, you won't get the tax credit on anything, so bear that in mind as well. Bottom line, EV6, it's an awful lot of fun, whether you get the GT package or the GT line, but the Ionic 5N is going to be in another universe of performance, and this gives us a little bit of a taste of what that will be like. And also, I think, perhaps a little bit more of a rational vehicle. This is going to be a little bit less flashy, a little bit easier to live with, I think, than the Ionic 5N. Keep in mind, we haven't driven that one yet, but that's my suspicion. And I think it is different enough than the Model 3 performance and Model Y performance that someone that wants to stand out a little bit more from the crowd, this is going to be a solid option for them. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section, and stay tuned because we're going to be driving an awful lot more of the Tesla lineup over the next few months. So be sure and stay tuned for that. Find us over at Twitter, Instagram, Post, Threads, blah, 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 all the various social media platforms that apparently we all have to be on all the time, and I will see you over there. Bye.